Anyway, uh, Tim's talk today is entitled, Those Dan Pictures, Rob Rogers and Historical Perspective. And I mean, I guess I'm in an, in en an enviable position of having to follow Rob, but um, it won't be hard because I'm, you were all having such a good time that we only have one direction to go. Uh, as a general rule of thumb, editorial cartoons are only as memorable as their nemeses. If the ruling classes are obdurate, hypoc hypocritical, or corrupt, cartoonists tend to outdo themselves through satire, exaggeration, and sarcasm. This is, by the way, the first editorial cartoon we know of. Okay. <laughs> Rob Rogers, of course, is probably one of the few people who mourns the departure of George Bush from the White House in the same way that Herblock wept when Nixon died. Happily, history, like Sarah Palin, has a way of repeating herself, and political cartooning will live to fight another day. Historically, political cartooning in the English-speaking world dates back, to, well, or the press, dates back to the 1700s from the imbecilic reigns of the King's George. Notable for their tendency to lose control of bodily function and overseas empire with equal aplomb, the Georges reigned over the a first great period of Western political satire, fostering a coterie of artists who commented upon the changing British world. This, by the way, is an um, official portrait of uh, Robert Walpole. This is not an official portrait of, but it's the same man. Contempt for the aristocracy is nothing new, but circumstances conspired to what William Hogarth and his contemporaries to sell, let William Hogarth and his contemporaries to sell prints without hanging for it. First, the monarchy's power diminished with the legitimization of dissent. Second, the public was becoming literate, urbane, and wealthier. Finally, printing, paper making, and distribution were changing, making the wider dissemination of graphic material possible. This is, oh, let's, how do you go back? Left arrow should go back. Left arrow should go back, thank you. Ah, thank you. Uh, along with the powder, this is probably William Hogarth's uh, most famous image of Gin Lane, what happened to London after the introduction of cheap J Dutch gin. Um, along with the powdered wig and smallpox, cartooning jumped the Atlantic to take up residence in the colonies. While Cruikshank's comic almanac helped redefine the genre in England, um, Scurrilous illustration, and scurrilous illustration had its place in the Republic. The early 19th century is generally considered a nadir for the wise-ass pictorial in America. The insufferably virtuous founding fathers made poor targets, and even today, as Paul mentioned, scholars scratch their heads when looking at drawings of Andrew Jackson in the second bank crisis. Like graphic pornography, its spiritual twin, illustrated political commentary remained the province of the cognoscente. Print technology made dissemination problematic. By the 1840s, American newspapers were evolving from mercantile broadsheets to partisan tabloids that fought for circulation using scoops, special editions, and outright falsehoods. The penny press had no time for pictures, which needed to be copied, transferred to woodblock, and cut to fit column leads. Instead, illustration found its home in the magazines that emerged in the antebellum period, including Frank Leslie's Illustrated Magazine and Harper's Weekly. Most pictures were being provided by itinerant journalists, um, several of whom were beginning to specialize in illustration, including Frank Ballou, Al Alfred Wode, and Thomas Nast, a German immigrant who had, the, who had misspent his youth on the streets of Manhattan and was already a familiar face along newspaper row. And this is now. Nass was a great draftsman. This is um, one of his illustrations for Harper's of a grand review of the Republic, um, of, the, of the Army of the Republic. But possessing wicked talent and derisive wit, Thomas Nass swung between sentimentalism and rapier like political commentary. His two most famous images remain current. He identified the Republican Party with its elephant as an allusion to wartime sacrifice. Um, in the 19th century, seeing the elephant was a phrase, which was a, and it was a colloquialism for engaging in battle. In the late 19th century, the elephant comes out as a Republican to remind people that the Republicans won the Civil War. And more familiarly, transmogrified St. Nicholas into our avuncular Santa Claus. Like a good duelist, Nast had the luck to draw at the right time. The United Nations was undergoing an unprecedented wave of immigration, and the illustrated newspapers became a conduit for Americanization. Uh, Rob is not the first per person to comment upon the relationship between the Catholic Church and children. Um, publishers such as William Randolph Hearst and Joseph Pulitzer survived for readers by any means, and this is important because the technologies start to change. Eventually freed from the constraints of veracity by photography, illustrators indulged in caricature, invention, and humbug. 
but most importantly was the villain. And there was William Marcy Tweed, the Gilded Age plutocrat who had the misfortune to be the chair of the Democratic Party of the state of New York and thus grand sachem of Tammany Hall uh, while Nast was on deck. Nast portrayed Tweed and his cronies as burglars, thieves, walking bags of graft, co-conspirators, and recently convicts. After Nast, the stable of editorial cartoonists generally devolved into a bunch of quizlings who depicted topics as compelling as the course of empire and the virtue of the Panama Canal. Part of this might have had to do with the rise of new media, since photography had matured, the telephone was making instant communication available, and the movies became their ascendancy after the turn of the 20th century. Um, indeed, we have President McKinley on film, not that anybody really cares. Talented cartoonists found new markets for their work. Sunday supplements carried comic strips. Magazines, particularly The New Yorker, printed sophisticated caricature, and animated film and comic books became major industries. Um, this is Peter Arno, who's actually a personal favorite of mine. He's an old New Yorker ca cartoonist. Um, but Arno is pleasant and funny, but he's not really that critical of the rich he, pr rich he describes. Um, but then something happens, and enter Herblock and Maudlin. Herblock, the pen name of Herbert Block, was already publishing cartoons by the age of 19 when he was hired as a replacement at the Chicago News in 1929. Politicized by the Depression, he began advocating for New Deal reforms and against Nazi aggression in Europe. After mustering out of the service in 1945, he led, left the syndicate for the Washington Post, where he continued to publish cartoons until his death in 2001. Perbluck lives forever. Bill Maudlin was bo born in New Mexico in 1921 and began producing cartoons for the Army in 1940. After participating in the invasions of Sicily and Italy, he was hired by so Stars and Stripes, where he earned the wrath of General Patton for criticizing the chain of command and the innate wisdom of military intelligence. Now, I don't know how these are come out. These are some maudlin ones I copied. And I was not very happy with the quality, but one of the things, <clears throat> one of the things I sort of noticed was how much these started to look like old woodblock prints. And I thought that was kind of a fascinating, and something I had never seen in his work before. Um, his drawings of two dog-faced inf infantrymen, Willie and Joe, continue to personify the ordeal of servicemen under fire. Um, after the war, he, went to a, he was, had a long career and won his second Pulitzer in 1959. He died in 2003. By recapturing, by recapturing the sardonic voice of the overlooked, Maudlin and Herblock helped reinvigorate the cartoon as a political art form. Working in an era of liberal ideals and oversized villains, both artists saw heroism emerge from the prosaic actions of everyday people and trusted that the seemingly insurmountable obstacles of depression, world war, racial discrimination, or nuclear annihilation could be ameliorated by the application of hard work and common sense. Not that they didn't have a lot of fun along the way. Herblock, in particular, seemed to rejoice in exposing the opportunism that fueled Richard Nixon's political career. This was a love story. I mean, this is, 19, this is like 19. 1956. This is 1973. For 20 years, Herblock just went after Nixon. You know, it was it was it was a lot of fun to, and it's a lot of fun to kind of look at over time. But to return to the subject at hand, he wouldn't remember. But I once asked Rob Rogers why his people were so lumpy. His characters inhabit a world many of us know quite well: that of spreading waistlines, imperfect orthodontia, ill-fitting clothes, and bad hair. Happily, everyone gets the same treatment, whether they're the sartorically challenged denizens of brood on Grant or there's innately elegant public figures, people like Ronald Reagan and Barack Obama. I suspect there's a reason for all this bad tailoring. It immediately makes a subject both suspect and human, and more importantly, leaves room for error. Who hasn't realized that our fly is open at the lectern or that we've just completed a job interview with spinach in our teeth? Rhetorically, there's a little bit of whoopee cushion in all of this, and if his occasional butt crack is any indication, <laughs> I'd argue that Rogers owes a great stylistic debt to Don Martin, the late cartoonist of Mad Magazine. And of course, Rogers is wise to remember his core constituency of Western Pennsylvania, 
Oddly, a population that has been promised the return of industry, the realignment of the service economy, and the rise of the creative class by a group of wonks whose solutions have offshore jobs, facilitated emigration, and proclaimed that the world's biggest brownfield is in fact ecotopia, has somewhat, have, have somehow developed an affinity for sarcasm. Besides, a little ridiculousness is a satirist stock and trade. While historians are loath to talk in generalities, the rise and fall of fortune tend to produce social friction. New economic functions emerge, migration fuels increased heterogeneity, and the inevitable scramble for resources, labor, and land, with the resultant winners and losers, tends to produce social situations and processes that are unique and difficult to decipher. To, jo to quote Jacob Bronowski, the British polymath, satire is a mode of challenging accepted notions by making them seem ridiculous. It usually occurs only in an age of where there exists no absolute uniformity, but rather two sets of be beliefs. And of course, uh, Rogers kind of knows this. S sarcasm and satire and irony kind of run, of course, run through his work. Of the two, one holds sufficient power to suppress open attack, but not enough to suppress veiled, one veiled ones. Further, satire is an intimately connected with urbanity and cosmopolitanism and assumes a civilized opponent who is sufficiently sensitive to feel the barbs of wit. To hold something up to ridicule presupposes an age of reason in which everyone accepts the notion that conduct must be reasonable. In an era where social observation seems to be largely determined by sycophancy or banality, Rogers has combined the graphic verb of Nast, the graphic verb of Nast, the lump and prole charm of Maudlin, and the idealism of Herblock. And coincidentally, like Hogarth, he's had a moronic George to work with as well. God bless him for it. Professor of Art from Carnegie Mellon School of Art. I've had as well known as an artist with a prolific work in a variety of media. Okay. Yeah. Pat is well known for prolific work in a variety of media, from drawings to prints and paintings. And I counted on uh, the web about 500, uh, 550 solo exhibitions from 1980 to present. So a great deal. Uh, reactions to her work are um, quite striking. One viewer has described her paintings as a, quote, mixture of T.S. Eliot poetry and slang. Uh, another describes her recent work as, quote, formalist canon meets zoological illustration, penetrated by medieval spiritualism and glossed with personal dream imagery. And Pat, in describing herself, writes that she finds, I'm slowing down so make sure that you can get your sucker. <laughs> Pat, in describing herself, writes that she finds absolute exhilaration in mark making, from the controlled and academic to the childlike and spontaneous. I often look to the work of outsider artists for inspiration and awe. Okay, Pat's talk today is entitled Free Cartoons and Comics in Contemporary Art. <laughs> Yep, yep. You need help? Yeah, we're okay. reenacting the funniest moment of the evening when the cartoonist had to come in and say two carnations. <laughs> <laughs> so, so while this is going on, I'm going to say something that I was going to say sort of towards the end, which is we have this uh, workshop um, on, we have a workshop on Saturday morning, beginning at 10 o'clock, going to one, it's called Cartoonist for a Day. You can sign up uh, and you can work. Uh, not exactly one-on-one, -on -one, but 20 on one uh, with Rob Rogers and do your own political cartoon. There's limited space. There are still spaces available. And if you're interested in that, um, you can contact, the contact information is on our poster. It's Tom Just Justifin. And his email address is justifin, J-U-S-T-O-F-I-N, at cmu.edu. So please, if you're, if you're interested, get in touch as soon as possible. So you can have one of the few remaining spots, however. More spots. Okay. And uh, as I mentioned, past talk today is entitled. That's it. Oh, perfect. This has changed. Is is entitled Thievery: Cartoons and Comics in Contemporary Art. Um, I begin by I offer my talk almost as a, an apology uh, and a welcome to Rob Rogers and his band of political cartoonists. Uh, 
regular cartoonist, political satirist. Um, throughout history, uh, all of the areas of fine arts have used the, uh, the word appropriate uh, to take each other's work. Uh, musicians have stolen from other musicians. Architects have used other, uh, the work of other uh, architects. But the area of visual arts has, uh, has used the safety umbrella, umbrella of appropriation as a convenient aphasia to borrow and steal from uh, ideas from other artists and many sources without any kind of apology or respect. Uh, and probably the area that has been uh, mined and plundered uh, the most is the creative work of cartoonists, uh, comic strip, strip creators and political cartoonists. The stealing's gone on for a long time uh, with, without much reciprocal respect. In truth, it's really thievery. Um, when we talk about uh, contemporary art, one of the, uh, and again, a lot of artists have used appropriation, but probably one of the first people that does come to mind is Roy Lichtenstein. And this is a piece that he did uh, in 1963, an early pop art image. And he frequently stole images. Uh, you're probably familiar with a lot of the, uh, uh, the war comics that he stole from. In this case, he stole, uh, this is from a comic book called The Star Jockey. Uh, it was written by a man named Ira Novak. And if you have a chance to look at it, it's a 65 panel comic book, all beautiful illustrations like this. Uh, Lichtenstein went on to become a wealthy man and Mr. Novak basically made a living. Um, we always, uh, artists used uh, the idea of appropriation and kind of kept an ironic stance from the people that they've been stealing from. I'm working two computers up here I'd like you to make a note of. Um, <laughs> this kind of moves on a little bit further. Um, uh, Philip Guston uh, worked, uh, began uh, to achieve notice in the early 30s as a painter, a uh, painter with imagery. And then uh, as the 50s approached, he uh, became part of the abstract expressionist uh, movement, primarily more color field. Uh, in the 60s, then, he did almost an about change and kind of began to reflect back on some of the imagery that he did in the 30s, but really began to look much closer at the work of comic book artists, uh, political satirists, and cartoonists. And, and this is one of his early paintings from the 60s. Want something else? Um, he also began to work directly with a lot of writers, and I think in this piece, um, a work he started with Clark uh, Coolidge, he spent a lot of time with the uh, poet Coolidge, uh, and they really began to work together in tandem, uh, writing spontaneous poetry, um, and Philip coming up with sort of the ideas. Uh, and I think there, there was some uh, reciprocal uh, exchange going on. Gustin was aware of Mad Magazine, and in return, uh, the, the artists of Mad Magazine were very much aware of Gustin. So there was a little bit of back and forth going on. Um, in ni around 1968, uh, Philip um, Gustin got very disgusted with the entire art scene and he moved to uh, Woodstock, New York, of all, of all appropriate places. And he became ex very good friends with Philip Roth, the writer. Uh, and he also became very disgusted with Richard Nixon. And over uh, a period of three or four years, they would meet once a week for dinner, uh, talk politics, how much they hated uh, the war and Nixon. And I think uh, this is, uh, again, an example. It's probably one of 30 of the series called Poor Richard, where he really worked uh, very closely. But uh, you can see his work in it. But again, you can see the images uh, and the connect connections to Don Martin in Mad Magazine. And I'm pretty sure, you know, obviously, that's Nixon. Um, I think one is John uh, Mitchell, and the other is Spiro Agnew at their prime. Uh, needs no explanation. This is one of the series. Guess who? 
Henry Kissinger. How did that move? I think we're on automatic. <laughs> Henry Kissinger from that series. Uh, this is a work he did with another uh, poet and writer, uh, William Corbett, that came at the same time. Uh, also along that time period, something really nice happened for cartoonists. And this is an image from the Harry Who. And the Harry Who uh, was a group of Chicago Imagist uh, painters. And they not only stole from comic book uh, and political uh, satirists and political cartoonists, they embraced them. And they, they did a number of shows together. Um, they were sort of some of the early people to say, wow, you guys can draw as well as we do. You know, come on into the academy, join us in the museum, you're part of our shows. Uh, you can see they even stole the little DC comic book uh, insignia. Um, at the same time, there were still a lot of shows going on um, with uh, work of artists that were influenced by comic book artists and political cartoonists uh, that really kept the people, uh, the real cartoonists, the, the real political cartoonists and satirists kind of outside the door. And oddly enough, this is a sculpture done by uh, Robin Page, a fluxist artist. And the title of the piece is called, There's a Lot of Art Around These Days That's Not Getting the Kind of uh, Recognition It Deserves. And they invited, uh, the trick ended up, they invited all of the comic book artists and the political cartoonists to come to the show. And there was sort of a turn of events, and the, the, the comic book artists, the political satires were so excited. And they got there, and they realized they were sort of there uh, to say, look, look at these quirky people that we're working with. So the respect kind of went back and forth, and it was sort of even a heartbreaking moment for a lot of the, the writers. Uh, a lot of shows came and went where people were, you know, side by side, uh, the political cartoonists, the so-called fine artists. Uh, but a big show happened in London called Pulp, uh, Pulp Fiction. And it really made this uh, big effort to say, look, we're all equals. We're stealing from you. You bother. You know. You take from us, but we're all equals. And Pulp Fiction uh, showed work of uh, bad, so-called bad boy artist Mike Kelly, who used the comic format. Um, he used the comic uh, political cartoon format to even uh, diss the art world. Another artist that was in it was Raymond Pettibone who uh, started out as a cartoonist, did uh, posters for the early uh, punk rock group Black Flag. Carrie James Marshall, uh, a painter who later began to use the comic book uh, format to get his politics and uh, work with communities. <laughs> and, and they were shown alongside of, of our crumb. Uh, this is Joe Sacco. Uh, it's a full political cartoon book. Uh, I'm way behind on my notes. And I just wanted to give a personal so aside that R. Crumb has made me read the Bible. <laughs> and it's not funny. Um, around 1980, and, and this is a horrible, I could not find a better reproduction of this, uh, a wonderful artist named Tim Rollins, Tim Rollins and K.O.S., uh, and KOS stands for Kids of Survival, and Tim Rollins called himself um, an educator, a conceptual artist that used education uh, to create artwork. And in a, in a very quick nutshell, uh, Tim Rollins uh, was in one of the worst, so-called worst schools in the Bronx, and he was given the so-called worst kids in the school, and they said they probably can't even read. And he brought to them, uh, he had them reading books like uh, Kafka's America um, and The Invisible Man. And in this case, they read Animal Farm. And uh, you can probably, all I can really pick out with the blur is uh, Castro um, and a few other political leaders of the time. Uh, this is from about 1984, and there are probably about 20 paintings in this series. And, and one of the great things that he did, whether it was stealing or uh, I think he did a lot
lot of this is a, 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 a to honor some of the uh, artists. He had the kids study J.J. Uh, Granville, who was a political cartoonist, from a uh, French cartoonist uh, from the 1830s. And you can see the kind of um, you know, the anthropomorphic animals. Um, he's a little bit sweet in his illustrations, but I think you can get the effect that he really didn't think much of school. It's another Granville. Another Granville. Uh, and then he also also had them look at Thomas Nast. And again, here are a couple. These are from the series that they did in 1984. And I think um, there, there, there's a very specific uh, drawing by Nast somewhere where he is using the dog figures. Um, so the students learned you know, a good bit about the political history of political cartooning. Uh, there's one of both. Oh. And they revisited Animal Farm uh, in during the campaign, and guess who that is? Um, uh, the little moose turds over there with John McCain. Um, just sort of a very quick aside with these paintings and all of the paintings that um, that Tim Rollins and, and KOS did. They were able. They've sold for so much. They've been able to build their own school and bring in the Bronx. And many of the kids that participate have been able to go on to college. Um, a few years back, I did a, um, a residency at a school, and I walked into the studio, and there was a great little sign, magic marker on the wall that said, it's never too late to appropriate. And I did what I thought was the only thing you could do, and I stole the sign. Um, <laughs> but, but being Catholic, I fessed up to the later that I have it. But uh, I, and I'm, fess, I'm fessing up here that, that I've been guilty, that I've appropriated from comic book artists and political cartoonists. Um, the draw, this is one of my drawings, and it's called War by Proxy, Spy versus Spy. And the term that I use, Spy versus Spy, comes from one of my favorite cartoons. Um, I grew up with Mad Magazine and every kind of comic book imaginable. Um, there was always a stack this high in, uh, in my house, and my parents just figured, well, at least they're reading. Um, <laughs> and and uh, I mean, I even learned the classics because of the series of classic comic books. But uh, the appropriation goes on because there's a theory that, um, I don't have my notes here, but the, the person that drew the spy versus spy was a Cuban nationalist that immigrated to the United States in 1963. Um, you know, during the, uh, mid the, the Cold War, but there's a theory that he took the faces from the old people, uh, the Black Plague, um, herb stuffed masks. So I decided I was going to make my work even better uh, with some really serious appropriation. And uh, the idea from mine was that the idea of war by proxy is uh, people standing off to the side and they look to the center and they see evil. And I say to Rob, thank you. I think you're that person in the e in, in the middle. You don't always keep the, thank God you don't always keep the left on their toes, but you're certainly keeping the right on the to their toes. And that's it. Thanks, Rob. <laughs> Questions for Rob or for Pat or for Tim? Should we all stand up? No. no. Just, uh, <laughs> any questions? And of course, we're going to get the questions. I should also mention again, we're going to have uh, a book signing, and uh, Joe and Costanzo is going to say a word in a second. But any questions? I'm sorry. Think about talk about sacred ties. I'm sorry. Think about talk about sacred ties. Talk about taboo with your subject, with your secret ties. What about your, your own self-censorship? Are, are there any subjects you have touched? Or are there any things that you've kind of done and then thought twice about and kind of self-censor? No, I, I think, I mean, I do self-censor all the time. Um, but I think it's more about, about taste and making it something that gets my point across and is understandable. It's less about, oh, I would never draw something like that. I mean, clearly, I'm not going to draw something, um, you know, like my editor said, you know, I, I, I a couple uh, a couple months ago, I got the cover of uh, City Paper. They let me do the cover because we were doing a story in the book, and and I said to my editor, "Is it okay if I 
you know, go over to the competition and do this. And he said, yeah, he's like, just, just keep it in good taste. No, no pornographic Santa Claus or anything like that, you know, because they, they have different standards over there. So, so I edit myself in terms of the standards of our newspaper, sure. I mean, um, but, but no, I mean, I think it's, I, I mean, certainly I'm, a, I'm a, a human being who has certain sensitivities and certain things you know, offend me. But I try to push it as far as I can go. Um, but I do self-censor more for content and humor and and, um, and whether 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 the drawing uh, you know whatever image I'm showing would, would misdirect people away from the from what the message is and lose them you know. And isn't that also the kind of the the, the danger of irony? And you pointed out already that yeah. some people read it literally. And yes. <laughs> and, and, but that's why, like, when, with the lynching cartoon, um, I knew that that was going to cause a stir, and that just by showing that image was controversial. You know, because I mean, I don't know if you remember the show that the Warhol, you know, they, they went to other places, other cities, but it was the lynching photographs. And uh, some people thought we shouldn't have that exhibit. I mean, it just, you know, it was wrong to show those images. But I think it's important to remind people of history. So for me, it was, it was. You know, I wanted the cartoon to run, but but the editors decided to show it to all of the African American uh, writers and editors at the paper. Uh, sadly, it wasn't that many. I wish it was more, but um, you know, so they showed it to everyone there, and they all said they all sort of did the same thing. They went, "Whoa!" And then they said, "But it's a good cartoon. We should run it." You know, so after after that, I felt like it was okay. But you're right. I mean, there's you kind of run the risk uh, every time you do something, whether People are going to get it and, and appreciate it, or or not. 